estimados, vamos volviendo justamente Quince minutos se pasan demasiado rápido, parece. No es, no es suficiente, pero si no vamos a estar de más, vamos a terminar muy tarde. Muy ¿Sí? bien. Entonces sigamos directamente uh, sin mayor introducción, porque ya a esta altura del día todos conocemos a James. Um, Importante mencionar ahora que en este taller que, que James uh, va a dar, ¿no? en inglés, Why is Latin America looking at Happy and Smile CDR? Uh, James va a realizar su uh, taller en el inglés que le destaca. Uh, muy, muy claro y preciso. James, all yours. Gracias. Okay. Let's get this going. So before I start, actually, I'd, I'd, I'm going to uh, answer one question that was asked in the Q&A that didn't get an answer to uh, to Diego's excellent presentation on it in, uh, on the IPS. I saw at the bottom uh, we had a question, ¿En qué países hay mayor adopción de IPS? And I thought that's a fun place to start just because it's... Uh, It is interesting. It is interesting to see. So IPS um, started as a, a collaboration amongst a couple of European countries, uh, specifically Italy, France, um, and Switzerland, I believe, were the initial participants in that. Um, I may be having the specifics wrong. I know Italy and France were two of them. Um, but of course, Uh, the European Union is one of the one of the parts of the world where it is very common for people to be, you know, very frequently crossing international borders for work. You know, there are plenty of people who live in Italy and cross into France and Switzerland every day to go to work. And of course, when you have a situation like that, it is very common for people to require healthcare in a different country than the one they live. So that was where IPS started. Um, what has happened since I think is really interesting. Um, The, the, the next area which have become really interested in, in IPS has been Southeast Asia. Uh, and specifically in Southeast Asia, they have a fairly different problem, which is that they've got many of the borders in Southeast Asia are are frequently crossed by sometimes by by refugees, uh, sometimes by people who have who have historical reasons for crossing. And oftentimes there are significant language barriers because of course in Southeast Asia, uh, people, every, every country speaks a different language and it's very common for, their, for people not to have common languages. So having uh, information exchanged a lot electronically becomes a, a critical factor because it means that you have some possibility of, of using electronic translation tools to uh, you know to actually translate information and make it useful so that part of the world has become very interested in IPS the other bit that I think is is kind of neat is people are starting to look at IPS not actually for international exchange but for I guess we'll call it intranational or trans or you know within a country um, I, this is another spot. I don't know how things work in Chile, but in, in Canada, of course, we are divided into, into 12 provinces and we have zero interoperability between our provinces. Um, all healthcare in Canada is delivered by our provinces. There is very little role for the federal government in delivery of healthcare here in Canada. So we do not have national interoperability at all. So even here in Canada, uh, people are starting to look at technology like the IPS as potentially being a solution for, for solving our interoperability concerns within the boundaries, the, within the provincial boundaries of our country. And I know that that is not unique to Canada. I know there are many other parts of the world that are, that are looking at that as well. 
Um, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see where where IPS goes. But of course, the the starting places are are places where people commonly cross borders for work. So hopefully that gives some context to that question around the IPS. Um, I, I wanted to answer that because I think IPS is is just it's going to be so critical. I think to the the truly global adoption of of fire and to for fire to fulfill its its destiny as a, a standard that globalizes health information and truly allows us to have that kind of interoperability that with health information that we have in other sectors. I think uh, data models like the IPS will be critical to that. So there we go. I will stop talking about IPS and move on to uh, our actual topic for today. Um, so this time around, I have got a slide that actually has a correct bit.ly link. Um, if you wanted to take a screenshot of that bit.ly link, you will get the, uh, the slides for the first talk, as well as this talk, as well as the third talk. They are all available um, as a single deck at the link that is on your screen. Uh, and I will put that up again uh, a little bit later today. So this talk is, it'll be interesting, I think, to do this as a virtual talk. Um, I have done workshops on this type of subject in person many times. This is the first time doing uh, this specific workshop as a virtual session. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how this works, especially doing it virtually and with a translator. <laughs> we will see what happens, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you will all get something good out of today's, uh, today's talk. This is a very technical session. I will, uh, I will warn you now, we are going to dive into Smart on Fire. Um, SMART is, of course, a technology that is providing a, a security layer around Fire APIs. And naturally, Fire is a great data standard. It's an excellent data model for uh, seamless exchange of healthcare data between systems. But healthcare, healthcare data is very sensitive. Um, and naturally, we really cannot use it unless we can secure it. So that's where SMART comes in as this, this lovely standard for enabling interoperability that can be done safely and securely and all of those great things. So I'm going to give a talk that goes through a bunch of concepts about how SMART on Fire works. And really what we're talking about there is OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, those two standards, um, how they work internally followed by a quick demonstration on Smart Launch. And we'll finish this off with uh, what we'll try to make an interactive session where we'll let you create your own data and run your own launch of a smart app on your own browser. Um, we'll see how that works. But I do have, uh, I've got some content prepared that will hopefully let you, uh, let you try that. So I'm uh, hoping we can do this without running out of time this time around. <laughs> we'll see what happens. So um, smart, the smart technology, and, and where does where does smart come in? Um, what I'm showing here is a quick example of of a problem that the health system has been trying to solve since the beginning of time, or at least since the beginning of electronic health records. And that problem is 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 as follows. On the left, I am showing uh, an EHR or an EMR, an electronic medical record system. And a problem that for many years, at least in my own experience working in hospitals, we very often wanted to write applications that complement pardon me, that complemented the functionality of the EMR. We recognize that the EMR is never going to solve every single problem, and it's never going to be customized to every possible workflow that could exist in our own institution. So we wanted to write some custom applications that, that, that added to the functionality of the EMR. But you know, every time we did that, we would build an application, we would make it, generally speaking, as a web form or something like that. Uh, these days, sometimes we would be writing phone apps or tablet apps or that kind of thing. But really for that to be a good experience, it needs to be integrated into the rest of the health system. 
Uh, and when I say it should be integrated, I mean specifically that it shouldn't mean the users needing to memorize one more username and password. It shouldn't be requiring users to, to have to go and reselect the patient that they were already looking at in their EMR. And it certainly should not require them to be re-entering all of the data into the app that was already entered into the EMR. If you can't do those things, to be, to be frank, nobody is going to use your application. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about medical apps used by doctors. And the fundamental truth here is that doctors are overloaded all of the time. They don't have time to be memorizing more usernames and passwords. They don't have time to be re-entering data. Uh, they have a workflow and that workflow begins and ends in the EMR. So your app needs to be integrated into that EMR if it has a chance of being used useful for anyone. So for years, I, I worked personally at a hospital. I, I showed you a picture of that hospital in the previous talk. Uh, I worked there for a long time, and we often had to solve this problem of trying to integrate our apps into the EMR. And we did that 20 years ago by developing our own, uh, I'll call them specifications, but really they were really, they were hacks. They were just messy little specifications we wrote that, that tried to solve that problem, often in a very messy way. Uh, and they often didn't work, especially if we were trying to integrate other people's applications. SMART is aiming to solve all of these problems in a standardized way. So ultimately, what I'm showing you on the screen are the three concerns of the SMART on fire specification. So if somebody asks you what is SMART, it's about telling an app who is the user who's logging into that app, what is the context, and the context in this, this case means if we're looking at a patient in the EMR, we should have the app show up with the exact same patient already selected. And, fun, and finally, how do we do data exchange? So how do, we, how do we collect data into our app that was entered into the EMR? And how do we push data that was collected in our app back into the EMR when, it's, when that data is relevant to the EMR? So SMART is all about solving those three problems. Fundamentally, how do we do those three things? The user context we do um, using a technology called OpenID Connect. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bunch about OpenID Connect in a minute. Um, if you haven't heard of OpenID Connect, I will guarantee you actually probably have already seen it, even if you didn't realize you were, you were using it. It is a very common technology, actually. Uh, the context part is done simply with uh, a standardized scheme for URL exchange. And then our, all of our data exchange simply says use fire for that. So those three technologies all combined together. This is what Smart on Fire is all about. So let's start with uh, let's start with that first first uh, who is the user problem. Um, for that, we use a technology called OpenID Connect, and I will say. Um, I'm going to use the terms OpenID Connect and OAuth2 uh, kind of interchangeably today. Those two terms don't mean the exact same thing, but I think for our purposes today, we can, we can sort of just say that they mean the exact same thing. Uh, so we'll say OpenID Connect or OAuth2, and I will probably accidentally switch between the two as we go. Uh, those technologies are solutions for access and identity management. Uh, and when we talk about access and identity management, there are two related concerns that are, are, are consistently needing to be solved. Um, and those two concepts are around authentication and authorization. Um, I am sorry to our translators. I don't know how you translate those terms. That's crazy, but there we go. Um, authentication is this notion of trying to verify that a user is the same person that they claim to be. Um, this is an easy concept, actually. Uh, we have all gone to a website and had to enter our username and our password. What we are doing when we enter our username and password is we are authenticating with the system. That's authentication. And really, when we do that, all we're doing is proving to that system, proving to that website that 
you know, I, James, am the same James who logged in the last time. And I'm proving that because I have a password that only I know. So I've proven that. Uh, as we as we go on, um, you know, we're seeing more advanced techniques, of course, increasingly things like certificate checks and access tokens and are, you know, one-time passwords and things like that, as well as biometric checks. All of these are becoming more common. All of these are examples of authentication. Now, authentication is one side of the coin, but it's not the, uh, it's not the entire thing. There is a related concept called authorization that we also need to consider. Authorization is all around this concept of once a user has authenticated themselves, what are they ultimately allowed to do? So um, for example, I, I am able to log into my, my, my bank website, uh, and this is a thing I do fairly regularly. When I log into my bank website, uh, I'm presented with a list of accounts, uh, and all of the accounts that I want to, to access belong to me. Um, and if I were to try and access someone else's bank account, I would be blocked from doing that. That's an example, a simple example of authorization. So my bank has an authorization system and that authorization system prevents me from accessing other people's bank accounts. All of this um, seems really straightforward, but as soon as you get into healthcare, you start realizing that authorization is an incredibly complicated uh, problem domain, actually. It, it, you think it's simple, but it is the opposite of simple for healthcare data. There are simple use cases, of course. Um, I, as a patient, you could imagine if I've got access to a health system, I should probably be allowed to see my own data. That, that probably makes sense. Uh, even that case is not nearly as simple as you might think. Uh, there are many places in the world um, and many organizations that have rules against patients viewing their own data. Sometimes it's a time-based thing where an organization doesn't want James the patient to see lab tests until a doctor has had the first chance to review them. Uh, because maybe there's a concern that James isn't going to understand that those, those lab results and is going to make bad decisions because he's not able to interpret them. Um, you know, sometimes there are rules around family members and delegated consent. So perhaps I, as a parent, should be allowed to see my children's data. That is a fairly common rule. But of course, maybe there are age rules there where once that patient, once that my child has turned 18, perhaps I should no longer have access to see their lab results because they're now an adult. Um, this is, these are just a few really simple examples, but there are many, many more of those. And I will tell you, authorization in the world of health data is a deeply complicated subject. Uh, it's really difficult to solve. And I am not here today to give you all of the solutions to those, but I am here to show you a few, uh, a few technologies that help in, in implementing the solutions to some of those problems. So let's, uh, let's move off of that for a second. So how do we fundamentally uh, suffer, su how do we solve all of those things? Uh, and again, even on this slide, I'm inter interchangeably using the terms OAuth2 and OpenID Connect. Uh, OpenID Connect is a standard that aims to solve the authentication and authorization concerns. Uh, in fact, OpenID Connect really is around authorization only, but it does contain some uh, some useful pieces of technology for authentication as well. Uh, the screenshot I've got up on the, uh, the slide um, is a screenshot that I suspect is, is a familiar one to, to lots of people here. Um, many of us have used, for example, that button that you often see online, which says log in with Google or log in with Facebook or log in with Twitter, or, log in with GitHub, uh, any of those. Um, those login with buttons are, what they actually are, are OIDC, uh, OpenID Connect, login, uh, work, workflow request buttons. And they initiate the flow that I'm about to show you. Um, as a part of that, you will see a screen often that looks much like the one I've got up on the screen right now, where I see a set of permissions. Uh, and the thing that's kind of nice is this technology has become common enough 
that I, as a consumer on, on online, I sort of recognize this screen and I kind of understand what it's asking me for. I understand that it's asking me for permission. Uh, in this case, I, I understand that it's asking me for permission to share some profile information from Facebook to a third party application. And perhaps it's asking for permission so that that application can add posts to my Facebook wall or something like that. Um, and we don't see it on this specific example, but often these screens will even give me some control over those things. So I might decide, yes, I agree that I'm going to allow that application to access my information, but no, I am not going to allow that app to post on my wall or access posts on my newsfeed. So I've got control and I've got the ability to sort of make an informed decision about what is this application online going to do with, with my information, in this case, my information being my Facebook feed. So this is a very powerful thing. Now that we're getting into a world where we have all kinds of different services online and all of those services talk to each other, and this is an absolute fact, we know that all of these services are talking with each other, having this ability to make informed decisions about how information flows from system A to system B is vitally important. Uh, for security and for privacy. So taking advantage of these technologies is a, 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 is a great thing. Um, yeah. So how, how do these permissions work? Um, under the covers, inside the protocol, uh, the OpenID Connect protocol uses this concept called scopes. And scopes are actually really, really simple things. Uh, a scope is a little tiny string of text that's baked into the protocol um, that effectively defines a permission. Uh, those scopes are going to be defined by whoever owns the APIs we're talking to. So in the Facebook example, we might define a scope called profile. Um, and as you can see in my example, the scope is just a little tiny string, in this case, the word profile. And if, if the app requests that profile string, then the app is requesting that, that access to my basic information. And maybe we're going to define a scope called post and another scope called friends. And those scopes, respectively, will refer to the ability to post on my wall and then to access data in my, in my or yeah, see my friends list, I guess that's what the, the friends example refers to. So the, the key point here is any, any application that is going to provide these APIs can define whatever scopes they want to. Um, these Facebook examples are not a part of the standard. They were defined by Facebook and anyone can define whatever scopes they want to. So this is where SMART comes in. SMART decided that they should come up with a set of scopes that were appropriate for healthcare. Um, I'm going to show you how those scopes work in a moment, but for now we'll have a simple example of one of those scopes. Uh, my example is this scope patient slash star dot read, which basically means access data about a patient. So you could imagine that if I wanted to launch a Smart on Fire app, and that app was supposed to access patient data in order to show it to perhaps a clinician or perhaps even a patient themselves, um, that would be an example of a scope that they might request. Uh, what I'm showing you here is an app called Juxly, which is a, uh, an example of a timeline viewer and actually quite a nice timeline viewer um, of information. This is a, a real production Smart on Fire app, which is often used um, in places that use these, uh, these technologies to show someone's health record as a linear time, sort of a timeline, which is quite a nice perspective, actually. So Smart on Fire internally, um, the, way that, the, the way that Smart on Fire works and the, the description I always like to give in terms of how these, these technologies work is that Smart uh, describes itself as a triangle. And that triangle is between the three parties. Uh, and I'm naming these three parties here. Uh, these, three, these three names are taken straight from the OAuth 2 specification. Uh, so they are they are they're standardized terms, and I will try to use them consistently across everything we do here. Those terms are the client, and the client in this case refers to the app. 
Uh, and there's an important distinction here. We're not talking about the end user. We're talking about the app itself. Uh, and I'll tell you in a moment why that's an important distinction. Then we have an authorization server. Uh, and the authorization server is wherever we're trying to log into. So that's the, 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 the system that actually allows the user to log in. And then we've got what OAuth 2 calls the resource owner. And the resource owner ultimately is the, is the API. These two boxes on the right, uh, sometimes they're played by the same party. So for example, if I'm doing a login with Facebook um, and I'm doing that so that some client can access Facebook APIs, then Facebook is both the authorization server and the resource owner. On the other hand, maybe I'm doing a login with Google, but I'm doing that so that someone can access uh, some other systems APIs. Uh, and in that case, Google is the authorization server but then that other system is the resource owner. Uh, and these are all, these are examples of sort of federated flows that are enabled by, uh, by the OpenID Connect protocol. So how does all of this work? Um, let's say I have gone to my client app and I want, whoops, and I want to, uh, to do a login with Google, ultimately what's going to happen, and we have all seen this happen online, is that one minute I'm on, an application, I click the login with Google button, and all of a sudden I have been taken to a website that's controlled by Google. So that's uh, that's an example of step one that I'm showing on the screen. And this is actually quite important uh, in terms of how this all works. I am going to be taken in my browser from my application over to Google servers. Um, my URL now says Google on it, and I've been taken over to the authorization server. That's step one. And why this is important is what you realize is I'm going to enter my credentials. I'm going to authenticate myself, but I'm not authenticating myself at the client. I'm authenticating myself with Google. And what I, what I mean by that is I'm not giving my username and my password to the application. I'm giving them to Google and Google controls those credentials. I trust Google to manage them. Um, and there we go. So ultimately I will, I give my credentials to, to Google. Uh, Google, I will say it'll, it'll show me a grant screen where it says, do you wish to share your profile information with this app? Um, presumably I will say yes. So Google will then give me an, an access token. Um, and an access token is like is, is basically a set of credentials that apply only to my session. Uh, they're a temporary set of, uh, of credentials that are given back to the client. And the client will then use that access token to access Fire APIs or any other kind of APIs we might want to try and access. So how do these things work internally? Let's get into the let's get into the protocol a little bit. Uh, part step three is the easy part. So we now I'm showing an example now of a fire request. Um, if I want to do a fire request where I'm fetching a specific patient, all I'm going to do is add what's called an HTTP authorization header. And in my example of this HTTP authorization header, I am including. Um, it, the contents bearer, which means we're using a bearer token, um, and then I include the access token itself. Uh, and all of that long string of text on the right is an example of, of one of these access tokens. So the part on the top, uh, this is the part of the protocol that's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, I'm going to take you through an actual example of how these things work. Uh, and this is where it gets really technical, but we'll, uh, we'll try and we'll see how that goes. This is always much more fun when we can look at each other, <laughs> but oh well. So how does all of this work? When you click on a login with Google or a login, for that matter, a login with Smile CDR or any other login with where we're doing smart on fire uh, author authentication and authorization, how this ultimately works is your client application is going to redirect you over to the authorization server, and they are going to form uh, a specially crafted URL that initiates uh, what OAuth2 calls the authorization code flow. Uh, this URL is an example of one of these. I've formatted it a little bit so that you can read it, but I know it's still kind of hard to read. Uh, on the very first line, we've got an example of the authorization URL. Um, we've got this parameter called the client ID, and this is a unique ID that is shared by both the client and the authorization server. 
uh, and it uniquely identifies whatever the app is that is trying to log in. Uh, the response type, you're always just going to have this third parameter, and it will just always say code on the right-hand side. This indicates that you are using what OAuth2 calls the authorization code flow, and for most normal uh, normal flows of OAuth2, this is exactly the, the flow that you'll be using. There are other potential values that go in here, but they're not actually terribly important to us uh, for any of the, the, the use cases we're likely to be solving. Uh, next, we request a set of scopes. Now, these are the scopes that the client is requesting that the authorization server uh, approve. And ultimately, this is what's going to get displayed to the user. So in this case, the client is requesting that the authorization server gain permission from the patient uh, or from the end user to, to gain this to do a patient read and then perhaps to get some information about the, the, the user's profile or something like that. Uh, and we close this off with this redirect URI. Uh, and this is a URL that the authorization server will use to send the, the user back to the initial client when, when the workflow is complete. So the user has now been sent to the authorization server. They are going to see a set of uh, a set of screens, and these screens, uh, I'm now showing healthcare-specific examples, but these will look these will look something like this, regardless of of what system we're using for our authorization server. I'm going to be prompted for a username and password. Uh, I'm going to potentially be set uh, asked to approve a set of permissions, and ultimately, I'm going to click on authorize. Uh, in my example here, I'm only being asked to approve one permission, but of course, as we uh, as we saw before, I sometimes I'm being asked to to approve a set of permissions, and if that's the case, I might choose to deny some of those, uh, and that information will be conveyed back to the client ultimately. So when we do this authorization code flow, I'm going to get redirected back to the client. And what actually goes back to the client is this temporary code. Uh, and this is kind of a, a funny and very complicated part of this protocol. But um, this code is a one-time code that the client can then use to perform an exchange. The client will talk once more to the authorization server to say, take that code and give me a proper access token. Uh, we do this for security reasons, and I don't want to get into the actual, the details of the uh, the security, the reasons for that right now. Um, it really gets complicated fast, but let's just say for now that we, uh, you know, this, this code is a temporary code and it is used to exchange for an actual access token. Uh, and there we go. So finally, we do what we call the code exchange. Uh, this is this is an actual web service call. So everything I've been showing you so far has just been the user's browser URL changes. Um, this final step is an internal web service call where your client app needs to make some sort of service call to the authorization server. Uh, it's going to talk to the server and say, "Here is my here is my authorization code." And the authorization server is going to reply back and say, here's an access token that you can use to make API calls. And then importantly as well, we will get back a list of approved scopes. And recall that the user may have declined some of those scopes. If they've done that, then the list of scopes may actually be different than the, the initial request from the client. Uh, in fact, the authorization server might even choose to add scopes that were not even requested initially. That is also certainly a, uh, an allowable thing to happen. So how do those scopes work? Um, what I'm showing you now is a, this is a, a photo that comes straight out of the, the Smart on Fire specification. And this is what they call the grammar for smart healthcare scopes. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing in that uh, ultimately it starts on the left and it finishes on the right. And the way it works is we will always start the name of a scope with either the word patient or the name user. Then we'll have a slash. Then we will have either the name of a fire resource or we'll have a star, which of course means all patient resources. Then we'll have a dot. Then we'll have either the word read or the word write. Uh, which, as you can guess, would mean that we are allowing, uh, we're approving for the user to read or write data. And then we will have, or we could have a star, which means both. 
and then that's the end of uh, the end of that grammar. So um, diving into what these things mean, uh, the the patient and user. This is kind of a, a confusing thing, but is important to understand if you're uh, if you're writing smart healthcare applications. Patient essentially means that uh, the uh, the client is requesting information about a single patient, um, and the access token that we get back then is going to grant the user access only to data that is about that single patient who was authenticated. That patient might not refer to the user who's logging in, but often it does. So this is commonly used in the context of patient-facing apps. If we're writing an app that's going to be used by a patient to access their own information, generally speaking, we will use one of these scopes that begins with patient. So for example, patient slash star dot star. Um, and interestingly, if we're writing a patient app where the you know, the app is going to ask for permission, you know, for my my earlier example of trying to authenticate so that I could see I'm a parent and I want to see my child's record. Um, I'm still going to use a patient scope, but I'm going to request permission from the, the authorization server to view a single patient record. And that single patient record belongs to my child in that case. So that's the patient scope. The second scope is called user. Uh, and that just means I'm requesting all data that the user has permission to see. And the smart specification doesn't really give any rules about how you would figure out which patients and which data the user is allowed to see. Uh, that, of course, is left up to individual implementations to figure out, and it's never an easy problem to solve. But the, the scopes that begin with user, these are generally for provider apps. The idea being that a provider usually has access to see an entire group of patients, or perhaps if they are working within an institution, they may well be able to see all, all records that that institution holds. So they would use one of these user scopes. Uh, I will mention, so a common practice when people start to use these scopes is they will use the stars, uh, star dot star. Uh, now, naturally, that is easy for the client developers, for the app developers. Uh, it is actually kind of a bad practice because it means that the user has actually very little visibility into, you know, into what they're actually approving. So what I mean by that is if we think about my Facebook example, you know, it's, it's nice when I do the login with Facebook that I, I understand all of the individual permissions that the app is requesting. I understand that the app is asking specifically for the, I, the, the permission to see my profile and to access my list of friends and to post on my wall. And I can make decisions based on that. Star.star .star is kind of the equivalent of the app just saying, I, I wish to access everything on Facebook. And then me as a user has no idea what that app is actually going to do. I just know it's going to do something to do with Facebook. So it's much better for us to use more specific scopes like patient slash star dot read, which allows the, uh, allows the user, the end user to understand in a more fine grained way that this app is trying to access Read, make read-only access to observation data. So I know that that app is not going to have any access to my drug information. I know that that app is not going to be allowed to write information to my file. All it's ever going to be allowed to do is read. So it's much better to use these more specific scopes. Uh, it, is, it is worth mentioning here that the the fire, so all of the smart scopes use fire resources. That's that's the level of granularity we use. In some cases, that granularity is, is fairly adequate. So for example, a medication order is a fairly, it's a nice, it's pretty obvious what a medication order does. Um, it's got a fairly limited scope. So a patient could make a pretty informed decision, yes or no, do I wish to allow the app to see my medication data? On the other hand, there are other resource types that are very broad, and the fire observation resource is a great example of that. Uh, the fire observation resource can, can be used to represent some data types which are not particularly sensitive. So, I mean, an example of that might be my, my daily height readings. Um, uh, 
If I have taken height readings often, those are going to be stored as observations and a fitness app might want the ability to look at my height measurements. On the other hand, there are very sensitive observations as well. So my HIV tests, for example, that would be an example also of an observation resource. And I think we can all appreciate that HIV tests are much more sensitive than my height readings. Uh, and I could certainly think of times when I might wish to authorize an app to see one but not the other. Uh, there, this is a very active area of debate within the Smart on Fire community. Should we come up with a, a more precise grammar that would allow us to specify that the app has access to one of those things but not the other? That debate continues today. Um, as of now, there is no official standard of mechanism for that. And it's unclear if there ever will be, just because this is one of those areas where it is almost impossible to standardize at an international level uh, because of how much variability there is in, in the way that data is captured and codified and workflows around how it gets used and all of that stuff. So it is hard to say what's going to happen there. I will mention that our libraries, we have a, a module called the consent services, uh, and those consent services are often used as a mechanism for applying a little bit more nuance. So we can understand that if the, if the client app is a fitness app, we might make decisions there not to release lab tests, only to release fitness data to that app. Um, even if the app has requested something like the patient slash observation dot read scope. So those consent services can be a, uh, a very useful thing for that. So that, uh, that is the most high level um, explanation of how, how the Smart on Fire protocols work. What I want to do for the remainder of my time here is to take you through a workshop, take you through a little workshop exercise. Now, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to show you an example of an actual working Smart on Fire launch. Um, and I, all of this launch is something that you can do on your own browsers. I'll do it first uh, just to show you. But then what I'll do is bring up on the screen um, an exam bring up a URL so that you can try doing this yourself. And then what I want to do is finally take you through a little exercise where we create some fire data together on a public server and then go through the Smart on Fire launch um, using data that you yourself has created. So I am kind of assuming here that you've got a, a laptop or at least some sort of workstation um, that you've, you can run locally, as well as access to some sort of REST testing tool. So something like Postman or the Insomnia tool. If you don't have those tools, don't worry. Uh, you'll still be able to do the first part of this, this workshop, but the last bit will, uh, will require um, a little bit of data creation. And I will, I will show you how to do those things uh, by doing it live once, but then, uh, then we'll move from that. So let me escape out of here for a second and copy this URL. So the URL that I've got up on the screen, uh, it's a bit long, but there we go. It's github.com slash, and then my name, James Agnew slash smart on fire demo. Uh, so that's where we're going to go. Um, and if you have taken yourself to that, that URL, uh, this is the URL here that I'm at. I am uh, first, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to show you a real example of a Smart on Fire application. Uh, that Smart on Fire application is an app called the Growth Chart app. Uh, and it occurs to me actually, before I show you the Growth Chart app, uh, there is one slide that I should have included in, uh, in the, the previous slides and didn't. So I'm going to take you there now. Oops, this is not letting me type. There we go. Smarthealthit.org. Uh, this, uh, this website, this is the specification for the, for the actual smart. This is the website for the smart on fire specification. Uh, one of the things that I want to draw your attention to on this website is the smart app gallery, which is the very first link on the left hand side. Uh, I'm going to click on that, uh, and I'm now taken to this website, which is the, the Smart on Fire app gallery. Why I think this is interesting is this website is a complete list of all of the known Smart on Fire apps, and it gives you a sense of the constantly expanding 
uh, international community who are developing these smart on fire apps. And there are people all over the world who are developing these apps that can interoperate with other EHRs and other EMRs. There are categories on the left hand side, so we can look at apps that are devoted to often we get asked about genomics apps or coordination apps. Um, there are a number of risk calculators for various things. Uh, and increasingly, actually, I didn't even notice this the last time I looked. We've now got a category for COVID-19 apps. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, so I, I actually don't know anything about these two apps. And I, it's not really obvious to me what either of these things has to do with COVID-19. But there we go. Um, so this is a uh, this is a curated list of all of the apps that exist in this gallery. The app that I'm specifically going to talk about uh, and demonstrate today is an app called the Growth Chart app. Now I like using the the Smart Growth Chart app for a few reasons. Uh, I'm going to click on the URL that takes me to its website. I like it for one because it's completely open source. Um, it is licensed, um, I believe, as Apache 2. Yep, so it's an Apache 2 thing. You can look through all of its source code. Uh, it's all written in JavaScript, so it's a, uh, a great example of how to do this. Uh, this app also takes advantage. There was a, a question in the Q&A um, about ja why, why Java, why not JavaScript? Uh, and a part of my answer to that question was, that even though we use Java for our applications, there are excellent libraries for implementing Fire applications in all kinds of other languages, and certainly including JavaScript. Uh, and this app is a great example of that. It takes advantage of uh, several of the, the libraries that have been created to help app developers build smart applications and Fire applications using, uh, using JavaScript. So this is all an open source application. What it does specifically, is there a screenshot here? No, there is not a screenshot. That's fine. Um, what it will do specifically is show the show what's called the growth curve. So this is how how for for newborn babies, uh, it tr it will trend how is the height and how is the weight of a newborn baby against the what are called growth curves. And a growth curve is just what are the normal expected values so that we can see is a child progressing you know, using the against these growth curves where we expect them to be. So what we're ultimately going to do before anything else, I am going to click on this launch button and I'm going to go through an actual smart on fire launch just to show you how this works. If you'd like to try this yourself, you're going to click on this link and you are going to use the credentials which I show below. So the username is admin and the password is whoops, the password is hello world. Those are the credentials I will be entering. So I'll click on this. And what just happened, and it was really hard to see it, but I was taken very quickly to a Smart on Fire application. And that Smart on Fire application created that redirect authorization code URL that I showed you at the start of the talk. So it quickly redirected me to my auth server. And my authorization server, in this case, is a Smile CDR server. I am going to type in my credentials. So those are admin. And then my password is hello world. And I will click on login. Oops. And I'm now taken to a permission screen. So I'm asked, you know, do I want to allow this growth chart application to read patient information? I could say no if I wanted to block the application, but that would be a pretty boring demo. So I will leave that as yes, and I'm going to authorize the app. And I'll click on authorize. And once I click on authorize, uh, the app will quickly go through. And what it does is it loads up um, a couple of a couple of data data points, and these are fetched using Fire queries. So it will fetch a few pieces of Fire information, and then it plots them on uh, on this UI. And of course, this is a great application for demonstrations because it's a very attractive, in, in, you know, application. It's well written. It looks nice, um, and it's working sort of internally to. To, to fetch a bunch of data using Fire. So what I'd like to show you next, um, I always enjoy doing this. I, any developers in the room, of course, will be very, uh, very familiar with this, uh, with the Chrome developer tools. 
I'm going to bring up the network tab. Now the network tab, we're really getting into the technology here. Uh, the network tab will actually show you the individual requests that go across. I'm going to do this once more. I'm going to hit refresh and I'm going to reload this page. And this time with the page reloaded, let's get rid of some of this. We can actually see a few of the requests that went across. And the one that's interesting to me is this request. So this server has made a request for fire observations. This long string here, which is difficult to read, is a bunch of LOINC codes. Uh, these are, so LOINC is a, a standardized vocabulary for observations, and it's making an assumption that we are in our server using the LOINC codes that correspond to height request and weight, or height readings and weight readings, uh, and it asks for a few other things. And finally, it's asking for what for an individual patient. And in this case, I've created a record that is named James-Agnew. So I send this across, and in its response, well, I don't know why it's showing failure there, because it actually did not fail, but oh well, I'm sure there's a reason for that. Um, it has made that request, and that request has succeeded. Actually, I will copy this URL, I think. Perhaps what I'll do is I will I'm going to switch for a second uh, temporarily over to Insomnia, which is a REST tool. No, I didn't even copy everything. Let's try that again. So I will make that request once more. There we go. So we have made a request, and what has come back is a collection of observations. Uh, and as you can see, these are observations such as a body height. Um, observation and a body weight observation, uh, and then whoops, and then the app in turn has plotted those against a, a normalized curve. So that is that is ultimately how um, how all of this works. What I would like to do for the remainder of our time is go back to where did my URL go? Let's copy that again. I'll go back to this GitHub page, which is where our workshop exercise lives. And I will point you to, if you, this is, I'm gonna leave this screen up for a little while. Here's the URL that we would use. First, I would ask that you try the simple launch just using the, the credentials that are here. And if you want to try being a little bit more advanced, what's even more fun is go through and try creating a patient that corresponds to yourself. Uh, and I'm showing you an example. I'm going to use, I'm using these IDs here, which are family dash given. Uh, but what I would recommend is just because lots of people, uh, you know, if you've got a whole room trying to test against the same server, you don't want everyone's data to overwrite everyone else's data. What I'd recommend is try using either your own name if you would like to do that, or you're welcome to just make up a name. It doesn't, does, it certainly doesn't have to be yourself. Um, use something else there. So I used, uh, James Agnew, but you could use something else here. Here are the instructions to create a patient, and I've given you some sample content for that. And here is here are the instructions and a sample for a weight reading uh, and for a height reading as well. Um, oh, there's a typo here. That should say height. Um, if you create these two, then you will you'll be able to actually do a launch. Uh, using this URL, but ultimately the one thing you'll want to change is instead of family given, you will want to use the ID that you you gave to your patient resource that you created. Now the one the one thing if you're going to try this yourself that I will point out is a little gotcha is to be you may want to create multiple height and multiple weight readings, um, but of course you will absolutely want to make sure that your effective times are something appropriate. Um, in order to make this easy, what I did for my example is I stated that my patient was born on January 1st. The reason this is important is this specific app is really only intended to be used for the first few months of the patient's life. So you don't want to be creating uh, weight readings that are, you know, that are years after the patient was born because they're not gonna show up in the app. So in my example, this patient was born on January 1st and then I create a, uh, I'm creating here a weight reading that was that's for January 5th uh, in order to provide some some realistic test data. And when I do that, um, I ultimately end up with I end up with a nice little graph like this.
So that is our exercise. I'm going to pause um, on this screen and let people uh, let people check this. Um, I will now open the floor up if there are questions. And if there aren't questions, I will say to anyone who's got a browser, this is a great time for you to go through and try this yourself. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, uh, you can ask questions in our, uh, our Q&A box. Thank you. Todo muy claro, parece. Están ahí. Parece que no. <laughs> Possibly it'll just take some time for people to try it before they have questions. <laughs> Julio Quinteros hizo una pregunta. James, okay. oh. you can see the question? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so do you have some recommended tools, plugins for IDE in order to work with Smart on Fire? So, I mean, I guess I will say that, you know, first off, uh, depends if we're, you know, Smart on Fire, of course, is a technology for building apps. Um, there are two sides to, to this conversation. Naturally, you're going to want to build servers, um, and those servers will, um, the, the server, of course, needs to, to build the server, the security side of things. Uh, and then you're on the client side, um, you've got a whole other set of concerns. Um, on the server side, I mean, I guess I'll say there, you know, you'll want to use a server language. Certainly, my recommendation is use Happy Fire for that side. Uh, and as soon as you're doing that, um, I, I, I can't think of a better Java IDE than uh, IntelliJ, which is certainly my recommendation for that. Um, but really, I think, you know, probably this question is not about the server side, it's about building apps. So it's probably about the client side of that. As far as the, the client side goes, I mean, I will say, first and foremost, um, you know, we build these things quite a bit. I think the IDE side of it doesn't matter so much. I know that I'm I'm not a JavaScript developer myself, um, but certainly in our office we have a number of JavaScript developers, um, and I know that everybody on our side there has has kind of standardized on an IDE called VS Code, which is the the Microsoft tool. I think everybody loves that, uh, but really an IDE doesn't matter so much. The thing that I will say is whatever your language of choice or whatever your framework is of choice of course everyone now nowadays in java in the javascript world are using some framework whether it's react or angular or um, Vue, or sometimes people are just using jquery um, whatever the thing is my certainly my recommendation there is look for a standard open id connect library and there are standard open id connect libraries for every single javascript framework that's out there uh, and my number one recommendation is you know don't try and develop all of the open id connect flow yourself you don't need to do that uh, all of these libraries are excellent and they 
they they cover all of the all of the edge cases and all of the security nuances to those specifications. So I guess my my biggest recommendation there, as I say, is is just you know look for look for the appropriate um, security library for whatever frameworks you're using and use it. That's my biggest recommendation there. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so uh, Julio has provided an update, um, which is the uh, the fire fuel awesome fire. I'm going to click on that for a moment. It's been a while since I looked at this repository, but this uh, this is uh, so I will say this is uh, written by a, a gentleman uh, in Russia named Nikola, who uh, is an awesome, awesome JavaScript developer and has been uh, has been curating, you know, various libraries. He's actually created a number of uh, a number of tools himself for uh, for JavaScript, his his personal repository has a bunch of great uh, great tools. This uh, this repository here, absolutely, I would recommend um, as a place to go and look for uh, for for tools and frameworks and plugins. James, tenemos una pregunta también, una última pregunta. Ok. Ok. Oh, sorry. My okay. screen had not updated. I see it. 
I did not understand quite well the case in which parents would like to query their child information. Should they use her credentials to specify that they want to query for her as a patient, or is there another mechanism that SMART uses for specifying which patient you want to query information for? This is an excellent question. Uh, I am not surprised. This is confusing. It is absolutely a confusing topic. So I am going to, I'll bring back, uh, I guess I'll bring back the, uh, the slide on this for a second. Um, the idea here, um, the idea here is that when a, when a client requests um, to the, actually maybe I'll go to this picture. Where's the diagram? So when the client um, makes a request to the authorization server uh, and it makes a request for patient slash whatever for a scope that begins in patient, it's requesting that the authorization server give it back an access token that is for one individual patient record. And this is actually all that SMART says is that the access token will be valid for one patient record, whether that patient record is for myself or for my child or for anyone else. Um, it doesn't matter you know, which patient it is, it just matters that that, that that token is for that one individual patient. SMART has actually completely left, a like it, it doesn't have any guidance at all or any information about which, how the authorization server would, would make that decision. That's all left up to the individual implementer. So in a real authorization server, um, you might imagine that um, in the context of healthcare, perhaps what you'll do is you'll enter your credentials, Maybe you'll have a second screen that's going to um, that's going to specify the permissions, but you might then have a third screen that's going to say you have permission to see this this record, which is your own, but you've also got permission to see your children's records. So which thing are you actually trying to look at? And you'll make that decision in the authorization server. And then the authorization server will reply back with an access token that's valid specifically for that patient. Um, this is, I realize that's, that's kind of vague, um, but that is kind of by design. Unfortunately, the rules for deciding how, you know, how one would, how a system would decide who we do and don't have access to, it would be impossible to standardize any of that because of course those rules are going to be different in every different context. So all of that, all of that difficult part of the authorization is left up to the individual authorization server. Uh, your question is one that we are we are ourselves wrestling with quite a bit. Um, I'm involved in a few implementation projects doing Smart on Fire right now. And this is a very, a very timely discussion. We are trying to figure out like what are what's a good workflow and what's an, an understandable experience for a patient so that they could actually make an informed decision about uh, about who to grant access to and how can an organization actually implement their individual policies. These are all problems that we are wrestling with right now uh, in our own authorization server technologies. So that uh, Ultimately, I guess the, the, the short answer to that question is all of those details are not a part of SMART. They're all left up to the authorization server to figure out. And it's not easy for the authorization server to figure that stuff out. I will certainly say that. Uh, hopefully that made sense, but do please feel free to add a follow-up if you feel like you'd like more elaboration on that. Uh, I do see we have one more um, one more question here. So the question here, que porcentaje de las características definidas en estándar fire implementa smile versus happy? So the answer to that, uh, and I hope, <laughs> I have apologies for my horrible Spanish accent. Um, the answer to that ultimately is, um, so the, 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 the definition there is Happy Fire, the open source project, deals with the Fire API. Um, so everything I've showed you as far as a Fire server, as far as 
fire data exchange, standing up um, the ability to share fire information and all of that. Everything there exists in our open source library, Happy Fire. Um, the technology that I just showed you that is Smile CDR specific, um, so the part that exists not in the open source product, is the authorization server part of it. So all of those Spart on Fire screens for authorizing users and granting access tokens and all of that, uh, that's the part that exists inside uh, Smile CDR. So that's kind of the, the, the drawing line we have between those two things. And oh, and we have one more question about. Uh, let's go back to slide forty. Oh, we're on slide forty. Um, although I don't think that's probably what the question was asking. I suspect the uh, the question is probably asking about this response here, which tells us uh, how long how long is this token uh, valid for. It's, this is kind of an interesting question. Actually, that's a great thing to pick up on. Um, this little, this little uh, attribute that we get back in our response when we're granting an access token, this tells us that the token is good for 2,000. And 2,000, uh, this is measured in seconds. I don't know why they chose seconds, but that's how the protocol works. Um, it's, it's telling us that um, the token is valid for exactly 2,000 seconds. Um, ultimately, this is all configuration in the authorization server. So specifically in, um, in our Smile CDR server, there is just there is simply a configuration setting that would allow someone to, to control how, how long a token is valid for. Um, and in fact, I put credentials uh, on, our, on our page. I should probably add this second login. I'm going to demo. I'm going to log into the server for a second. I'll add this. Uh, I'll add this URL to the uh, to the page so that other people can try this. But I'm going to log in again using admin and hello world. Oops. Hello world is my password, and I will log in. Get out of here. If I click on my client definitions, this is where we define our growth chart app. Uh, and ultimately, if I scroll down a little bit, this is where we control the access token, how long the access token is good for. Um, so in this case, that access token is good for 3,600 seconds. In my example on the slides, it would have been uh, for 2,000 seconds. Now, there's one other thing I did not talk about at all today. Um, I said that the authorization code flow was the only code, code flow that mattered. Um, I was really ignoring another flow that's called the refresh token flow. And in fact, um, the refresh token flow, if you're doing smart on fire for real, is another, another part of the, the protocol you will often use. The refresh token allows you to get a second, essentially it's a, a mechanism that you can use to renew your token. Um, and in the real world, often what you will see is access tokens that have a very short uh, validity period. So they'll be, they'll be valid for one minute or five minutes or something like that. Uh, and then you can use this other flow called the refresh token flow to, to get a new token every time you need it. Uh, and we do this in order to, uh, to give the server the ability to quickly, ex to quickly revoke tokens that are no longer supposed to be, to be valid. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the refresh token flow because it is pretty complicated, but there are excellent tutorials out there that, that go, uh, go on that. Oh, and, you, and okay, so ultimately, um, the, uh, so the final or the next question here is sort of is, is getting at, um, well, why don't we read it? Se, se podría implementar una comunicación interna entre servidores? Lo preguntó porque el servidor Fire y el de autorización podrían ser independientes. Me explicó uno, un Azure uh, Active Directory versus Happy Fire que se encuentra un otro servidor, incluso no cloud. So the answer to this is, is getting into some interesting sort of aspects to how these protocols work. I'm going to bring up my, uh, my triangle bit again. 
Um, and I, I mean, this is actually, it's a great question and I'm glad it was asked. I sort of explained this as a triangle and I didn't actually explain why these two things are separate. And it's, it is actually important to understand why these two things are separate. Um, the, the, the way that uh, the OpenID Connect protocol works is using these tokens, which have been digitally signed using what's called uh, public key cryptography. Uh, and I, I certainly today in this talk, we don't, have, uh, we don't have nearly enough time. I have a longer version of these slides that go into all of the details of how public key cryptography works. But the part that, that matters, the short explanation of that is the authorization server is going to issue a token and that token is going to be digitally signed by the authorization server using a private key that is held only by the authorization server. Uh, and the, there's a corresponding public key that that authorization server makes available to the entire world. So the access token is digitally signed, it gets sent to the client, the client then transmits it to the resource owner. And one of the really interesting properties of of public key cryptography is that the resource owner is able to see the, the access token. It's able to see the digital signature that comes along with that access token. And because it knows the public key that belongs to that authorization server at the top, it's able to independently verify that it knows for sure that that token was issued by the authorization server. So that, that interesting little property of, of uh, of, of sort of how these things are implemented means that the resource owner can actually, it, it, it knows 100% for sure that the authorization server issued that token and that that token has not been tampered with, that nobody has, has changed it or, or modified it uh, in the communications between those things because of that, uh, because of that signature. And ultimately, we know that the resource owner never needs to communicate directly with the authorization server. So that's an important sort of property of all of this. Uh, that's the, the technology that makes this all work. Uh, I'm hoping that that actually is answering the, the question that you were asking, but do please post a follow-up if that was not the, 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 the nuance you were looking for. Yeah, muchas gracias, James. 